Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on operational risk and resilience, and the chapter on case study model risk and model validation. Let me just quickly remind you that our previous chapter was called something like Guidance on Model Risk Management, and one of those learning objectives was to identify the best model and apply the model in the most efficient way and interpret the results so that we, we can lead to some kind of an estimation or a prediction. In this particular chapter, we're focusing on the simple fact that we've already identified the model that we're going to use, and then we need to figure out what that level of risk is and then how to validate it. So we essentially have two learning objectives like we've had in these series of chapters. The first two are almost kind of one, uh, as I think about them lumping together, you know, exposed to model risk and then the model risk management function. And then there's that term that we hear all the time, best practices. And then, of course, the last learning objective is going to be a series of lessons learned. What did we learn in those previous ones? Things like transparency, things like the responsibility of investors to become informed, the reliance on all of the uh, entities that are involved in the uh, trading of options and futures contracts and mortgage-backed securities and bonds and all those kinds of things. So lessons learned are that essentially that the mistakes that are made out there from one party or another party, we can all, we can all learn from them. And we'll see that in, uh, in a really cool example at the very end of this slide deck. So let's go ahead and, and define a model. This definition is taken right from the U.S. federal government. Uh, the important part there, and I'm guessing you guys know this, a quantitative method uh, uses input data into quantitative estimates. Hmm. So uh, notice the second part, we have these quantitative inputs, but they can be partially or wholly qualitative. I mean, the obvious notion is that we turn you know, some type of qualitative input into a quantitative. Remember, we did a dummy variable with regression analysis, and there are lots of other examples there. Expert judgment, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. That makes perfect sense. So key characteristics rely on a set of assumptions. So look quickly down at the bottom. We spent lots of time on discussions on these types of examples. <clears throat> You know, notice over in the top right, capital asset pricing model. This was developed, you know, in 1964 or so to help us identify what is a reasonable level of expected return on a share of stock. That's the capital asset that we're pricing. And of course, it's based on risk. Skip down to the bottom left there, the Garch model. This thing is used for estimating volatility, most likely in an option or maybe other some kind of other derivative security. Notice the top left value at risk. We're looking at that left-hand tail. So in all, in all of these models, there is some element of risk. So we need to make some assumptions about risk. You know, clearly up in the top right with capital asset pricing model, we're saying that beta is our appropriate measure of risk. In some of these others, including value at risk and, and the Garch models, most of the Garch models, and portfolio optimization, we're saying standard deviation is the appropriate measure of risk. And then in some other models, maybe there's some generalized, uh, generalized measure of risk. So rely on a set of assumptions Lots of those assumptions have their backgrounds in statistics, like maybe normal distributions, maybe there's some kurtosis, but the key assumptions in there is what is the definition of risk? Of course, they're goal-oriented. Go back to that bottom right portfolio optimization model. What are we trying to do? If we have uh, 15 stocks in a portfolio, we're trying to determine what is the optimal weight in each of those 15 stocks, and there's the goal and all these other models have goals as well. Focuses on a few key variables and relationships. So, of course, that means that not only are we going to have a measure of risk, like beta or standard deviation, but we need to have a measure of co-risk. Lots of times, historically, we talk about uh, uh, correlation coefficient, but then in recent years, we talk about uh, copulas. 
historical data, you know, in my classes, this is what we do because just in an academic setting, it's super easy to go get historical stock prices or bond prices or option prices. However, however, that doesn't mean that we have to be limited to historical data. We can make estimates of data based on a model and then use those estimates as inputs in yet another model that reflect the dynamic nature of the economic scenarios. And so that's what that last diamond point is suggesting uh, simulate various scenarios. And I sure hope I'm not repeating myself too much. I always think of an Excel spreadsheet when performing sensitivity analysis or scenario analysis. And you can do that for each one of these models. In fact, I'm sure I've said this to you before, in, in my investments class, we get out the Excel spreadsheet, we use the solver function, and we change all of the constraints inside of that solver function so that we can have different goals. I mean, I could tell my students that what we wanna do is that regardless, regardless of standard deviation, we want to minimize risk or we want to maximize risk or we want to minimize return or maximize return. I mean, you can come up with crazy models, uh, crazy goals inside of the Excel spreadsheet. But of course, what we're trying to do is, and let's go back to a previous recording. What we're trying to do is have transparency uh, and we're trying to be fully informed. And what we want to do is use these models to promote transparency and to promote the uh, dissemination of relevant information. Now, model risk is defined in this chapter as an adverse consequences that result from, you know, all, sort, all sorts of bad things that can happen inside of a model. And we do this in two forms, execution risk and conceptual errors. Now, we're going to look at two examples. Look down at the bottom, Barclays and uh, the Mars. Uh, uh, we, sent a, we, sent a, we sent a thing that was supposed to you know, travel along Mars, but it didn't quite make it there. So we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, the model doesn't perform as intended or designed. Coding errors, implementation errors, incorrect data inputs. Um, what the chapter does emphasize is that they, these input errors can seem trivial, but they may lead to catastrophic losses, which of course happened with, uh, with Nassau. Now, conceptual errors, this goes back to the previous chapter in which we said something like, hey, let's go ahead and let me go back here real quick. You know, let's go ahead and pick a model. Let's suppose we pick the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model and we want to use that model to price some kind of a derivative. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's just a regular old call option on a share of stock, but maybe it's an option on a futures contract or maybe we extend it to something new and innovative. Maybe it's a call option written on a piece of artwork or a movie script. And so what are we assuming in that option pricing model? Well, we're assuming some kind of a <clears throat> at least nearly normal distribution. Maybe we can call it a log normal distribution. And of course, that's appropriate for many underlying assets, but it might not be appropriate for underlying, some other underlying assets. So invalid assumptions and incorrect modeling. Maybe that log normal assumption in the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model is appropriate for pricing a call option on a share of stock of uh, Procter and Gamble or Johnson and Johnson. But with my artwork example, maybe it is completely uh, inaccurate. Now look at the second embedded bullet point, identifying these errors and these assumptions and conceptualization is challenging. That's why, that's why what we need to do is couple all of these models and have a primary model, then a backup model. You know, the, uh, the, the chapter talks about, you know, different kinds of tiers and that's perfectly acceptable. My preference would be to say, all right, we're going to use the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model here, but maybe we have the black model down here as kind of a substitute. You know, it's exactly like what happens in professional sports, team sports. You know, when uh, when someone gets hurt, what do you have? You have somebody to come in and what do coaches always say? You know what? It's tragedy that this individual was hurt, but next uh, next player up, whoever that next player is, that player has to be ready to take over. And that's why I think it's important to couple these models and have backups and, uh, and substitutes ready. 
Are you guys sick and tired of me hearing use hear, hearing me say the word transparency? I mean, this is super important in almost every chapter that we describe. But then remember, so we have this model, Black Scholes Merton, and we we you know list the assumptions and we say this is why we think it's important, and then we say comma, and, and we're going to write some sentences that sound like well we're aware that this might not work uh, as perfectly in the in the artwork market as it does in the option market. But hey, trust us, we're going to figure out how to make it work. And if it doesn't work, then we may adjust it. We may discontinue it. We may pick it up and, and throw it in the trash. We're probably not going to do that because these models, and let me go back here real quick. You know, these models here, they've been around for a long time. They're probably going to be around for a long time, but we need to make certain that we're adjusting them to reflect new information about markets and securities. Now, how about this model risk management function, how this ties into that learning uh, objective? Look at the first arrow point. You're not surprised. We've talked about measuring. We've talked about monitoring. We've talked about reducing risk. We've talked about identifying. We've talked about quantifying. We use all of those terms as we move through the FRM program. So you shouldn't be surprised to read those words here for model risk management function. I mean, wh what are we doing? We want to determine some kind of standards. That means that, hey, we will not use a model if it doesn't meet this particular set of benchmarks so that we can ensure that we have high data quality. And when we look at different versions inside of this model that we're probably going to come out with maybe not an identical result, but nearly, nearly identical results and maybe similar results is probably satisfactory. Yeah, different tiers depending on their complexity and what the outputs are going to be, what that loss amount might be, um, and if they comply with regulatory purposes or are they for information purposes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's probably an important distinction and might be a and might be a good exam question. Now, remember I mentioned these uh, copulas just a, a few minutes ago. Let me just give you a quick history lesson. You know, correlation coefficients, these have been around for thousands of years. But what we have found is that the correlation coefficient calculation, however we do it, whether we use returns or some other kind of input, you know, takes a look at the relationship between two variables. Correlations that are close to one means that those two variables, of course, they, they move together and move by similar percentages. What we know about investing in things like my artwork example or municipal bonds or maybe some other kinds of securities that don't look like equity securities is that they have low correlations. The problem then is, of course, that when we have stock market crashing, that those correlations, which might have been 0.1 or minus 0.1 or 0.3, they all move to one. And you know this because when things crash here, then they crash over there. And that makes perfect sense. So we needed a better model to evaluate the relationship between two variables. And that's why um, this dude came up with the, uh, with the copula, you know, in the early 2000s. And what this thing did was take a look at, you know, joint distributions and marginal distributions and said something like, all right, if we have a, a share of Target and a share of Walmart stock, we can easily take a look at their daily returns and compute a correlation coefficient. But what that does is it, it ignores some extra variables that are out there that might be relevant. I mean, let me just pick some other, uh, other examples, you know, you got Target and Walmart here. What's a what's what influences the way that they move with each other? Well, maybe some Fed action, maybe the price of energy, uh, maybe whether Santa Claus has snow on Christmas Eve. You know, so you have all these variables. Of course, the Santa Claus that was a silly example, but you have all these extra variables that are going to contribute to that relationship, and that's what the copula has done. Now, the problem, and here's the what happened and the lesson learned, is that in 2002 and four and six, that lots of financial institutions used this copula and they estimated the relationship between and among all these different uh, variables, including and specifically in the credit default swap market. And then we had this crash and 
uh, and everyone said, oh, the copula, I'm sorry, the copulas, they're, they're not any good. They're, they're just as bad as the correlation coefficient. But what's the lesson learned? What financial institutions failed to do was to update the pricing of these credit default swaps to reflect all of this extra information that was pouring into the market prices. So what's the lesson learned here? You should not rely solely on a single model. That's what I was saying earlier. Make sure you're aware of the limitations and assumptions. And so what was that limitation and assumption was that, well, that these data inputs are going to be reflective of current market prices, which of course they were all the way up to some point and then they weren't. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Look at the third one over there. Relevant model should be updated. That should make perfect sense. Here's an even sillier example. You know, Barclays acquired Lehman Brothers. There was a list of contracts inside of an Excel spreadsheet and somebody was supposed to delete this column, but it was hidden instead. So what, ha what happened then was there were, you know, 180 or so contracts that were inadvertently included in this contract, you know, written legal and binding contract. And so it was actually, I think the details are that it was, it was discovered after the contract was signed, but both parties then somehow agreed that it was, uh, it, that those contracts could be excluded. Yeah, lessons learned, accuracy and data compilation, rigorous verification. I mean, think about it, something as silly as a column in Excel that should have been deleted, but was hidden somewhere. And you know how you, you look along the bottom there, you can have, you know, book one and book two and book three, you know, all those things. My students hand in Excel assignments that sometimes they have 10 of those down at the bottom and I, I scratch my head and I think, okay, if that's the way they think, that's fine, but let's just make sure, let's make sure that we rigorously verify all these. Recognize the limitations of spreadsheet software. So that should make perfect sense. All right, so here's this, this Mars spacecraft that I was telling you about. I want to give you just a quick story. Maybe some of you are golf fans would watch, uh, who were watching a recent major golf tournament on TV. One of the international players was interviewed after uh, his round of golf. And the interviewer said, hey, that was an awesome shot that you hit on 16. What club did you hit and how far, what was your distance? And the dude looked at him and goes, well, uh, you know, I hit an eight iron. I was 131 meters away and the interviewer looked at him and I looked at the TV. I'm like, I don't have any idea what that means. Meters, yards, give it to me in yards. I mean, I can do the math, right? But I didn't want to get my calculator out and do the math to convert. But that's essentially what happened here with this 100 and million, $125 million spacecraft. Look at the orange, uh, the orange teardrop point. One team used metric units. I have no idea what those things are. Another team used imperial units. I have no idea what those things are, but it's the difference between yards and meters inside of my golf example. And so dangerous low altitude and it disintegrated. What's the lesson learned? This is important here. We've talked about this before. Standardized communication. Once again, rigorous validation and collaboration over on that, uh, on that third one. So that takes us through uh, model risk and model valuation. I think the important questions and the most uh, uh, fun questions are lessons learned, not just in the, these three case studies, but all the case studies that we have done. So my advice, and I think I've said this before, is to go back over those lessons learned from each one of these chapters. And what you'll see is that most of those lessons learned have similarities. And so you, you should be able to apply them to almost any question on the exam. So anyway, hey, thanks for watching. I had fun and good luck studying.